Hello everyone, welcome to an academy. Let's crack me PG. I'm Dr. Shilpa Dinesh. I'm a practicing pediatric consultant and an educator in an academy. I have an experience of teaching undergraduate and postgraduate medical students and I've done my MBBS and MD from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. So today we'll be discussing about sickle cell anemia. Okay, so everything in detail about sickle cell anemia. Before that, I would want to talk a little bit about an academy. An academy is India's largest online learning platform. There are a lot of benefits you can avail from this platform. Firstly, the daily live classes. So there are regular classes happening in this platform by various educators. You can attend your favorite educators class, ask your doubts, uh, engage in discussions and these doubts will immediately be cleared in the live chat box. Also coming to the structured course. So whenever you're preparing for any entrance exam, you need to have a structured approach. You need to plan really well. So the, by the time you give your entrance exam, you need to have re, uh, revised very well. So here in an academy, all our courses are structured and in line with your exam syllabus. And this is going to be a huge boost for your preparation. Next, coming to the live tests and quizzes. So um, again, when you're preparing for your entrance exam, you need to evaluate yourself. You need to know what are your strong areas, what are your weak areas. So you need to analyze your performance. So once uh, you are able to do that, you can concentrate on the subjects which are weak. At. So that is possible only if you attend regular quizzes and tests. So here in an academy, there are regular quizzes and tests, ha tests happening and that will help you to analyze your performance better. Also coming to the unlimited access. So once you subscribe to the subscription, you get unlimited access to all the classes. Okay. And also the classes which are exclusive to the subscription platform that is only uh, ex uh, to the subscribers to the sub of the subscription. Okay. So once you subscribe to the subscription, you get access to all the classes. So even if you have missed the live class, you can go back and watch the recorded classes again and again. All this in the comfort of your home and the comfort of your own device. So I would highly I recommend this platform and using this platform in the beginning part of your preparation will take you a long way. So these are the top educators in this platform and they have regular classes. You can go and attend their classes as well. Okay, all the 19 subjects required for NEET PG preparation are taught in this platform and there are various courses also offered like the foundation course, there are crash courses happening. So you can go and uh, go to the An Academy app and check the courses which are available. Also, this is the NEET PG subscription package. So as you can see, the NEET PG subscription package varies from one month to two years. So I would suggest the one year or the two year subscription that becomes very uh, reasonable when, the, uh, when coming to the price. Okay. So uh, for the students who are, in the, who are in their need, uh, who are giving their need PG 2021, for them the six month subscription would be good enough. Uh, for the six month subscription, it costs you 20,000 and using my course shield path, then you get a 10% discount and it will come up to 18,000. For the ones who are there in their third year MBBS, final year MBBS or the ones who are in their internship, for them the one year or the two year subscription becomes very, very reasonable, right? So the one year subscription costs you 25,000 and using my course Shilpa 10, you get a 10% discount and it will come up to 22,500. The two year subscription will cost you 30,000 and using my course Shilpa 10, you get a 10% discount and it will come up to 27,000, okay? So the prices are very reasonable. I highly recommend this platform and start using the uh, an, an academy app uh, from today itself okay you will come to so there are various uh, special classes even that is free you just have to uh, download the an academy app and watch the classes okay so you can watch uh, any amount of uh, classes so all the special classes are free only the um, there are few subscription classes that you have to be a member so you can go and uh, explore the app and then you will be uh, maybe you will become more confident to uh, go for the subscription okay so now so now we'll talk about today's topic that is sickle cell anemia so in sickle cell anemia first thing is the hemoglobin which is there is the hbs so how does this hbs hemoglobin develop so basically there is a this is a point mutation so there is a point mutation in the globin gene okay so hemoglobin that is a globin gene which happens so there is a point mutation so what happens okay so there is a single base pair chain so you know this thymine adenine other base pairs okay they form the base pairs so there is a single base pair chain so there's the chain says a chain that is the thymine from thymine, uh, uh, thymine for adenine. So uh, instead of adenine, thymine will be replaced. Okay, thymine for adenine. 
will be replaced. And as a result, so this happens in the sixth codon of the sixth codon of the beta globin chain. Sixth codon of the beta globin chain. And as a result, what happens? This change in the base pair will co code for valine. So instead of glutamic acid, valine will be formed. So valine for glutamic acid will be formed. That is glutamine. Okay. In the sixth position. Sixth position of the beta globin molecule. This is the gene. Sorry. Beta globin molecule. So this is what happens. So this is the main uh, defect what happens. And as a result this leads to HBS hemoglobin. Okay. So now what happens? What is the feature of this? So basically, now when this uh, hemoglobin is exposed to deoxygenation, okay, so when there is deoxygenation, so this HBS, when there is deoxygenation, goes into formation of there will be HBS molecules which undergo polymerization. So this polymerization is also called as gelation or the crystallization. So this HBS molecules undergo polymerization okay so this is called as gelation or uh, crystallization so what happens so at this uh, point these polymers will distort the red cells so the polymers are not good for the red cells so they will distort the red cells and they and they'll form sickle cells Okay, sickle cells. So at this point, so initially what happens when there is reoxygenation happening, reoxygenation happening, this sickling will revert back. Okay, so there will be reversible. The sickling will be reversible in the beginning initially. With reoxygenation, it becomes reversible. But as the sickling, so there are more and more episodes of sickling happening. So then that will lead to membrane damage. So uh, repeated episodes of repeated episodes of sickling leads to membrane damage so what happens membrane damage so there will be accumulation of calcium in the cell and there will be loss of potassium in the cell so there is accumulation of calcium loss of potassium and as a result this uh, sickling becomes irreversible and then this goes to the spleen and there it is destroyed okay so you should remember so because of accumulation of calcium calcium accumulation and loss of potassium loss of potassium this becomes irreversible so one second i will just make some space Okay, so then that becomes irreversible. So I have a picture. So first of all, what is this? So HBS, then sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin is called the HBS. So it is a point mutation. So what happens? There is a single base pair change. So thymine uh, is, uh, is replaced for adenine. Okay, that happens in the sixth codon of the beta globin gene. So as a result of this single base pair change, they eventually what it encodes to. So this decodes to valine. So instead of glutamine, there will be valine. Okay, in the sixth position of the beta globin molecule. And as a result, the HBS is formed. So now once the HBS, that is a hemoglobin S which is formed, that if, uh, if that is exposed to a, a deoxygenation uh, and uh, deoxygenation so that time what happens there will be this hbs molecules which undergoes polymerization that is called as crystallization or the gelation so this polymerization will distort the red cells okay so in the initial part in, in, the, in the beginning of uh, this disease there will be reoxygenation happening and the sickling is reversible but as these episodes of sickling increases there is more and more membrane damage and as a result this rbc's they will accumulate calcium and there will be loss of potassium and this sickling becomes irreversible and this sickle cell goes into the uh, spleen and then they will be getting destroyed okay so this you should know so this is a picture from uh, robins so over here you can see there is the uh, replacement of adenine to thymine okay and as a result instead of glutamic acid that is the glutamine uh, is replaced by 
uh, valine okay and see now over here there is oxygenated in oxygenated form these hbs cells are fine but during the deoxygenated phase during the deoxygenation they form this hbs uh, polymers and in repeated uh, episodes of this deoxygenation it will become irreversibly sickled and then it goes to the spleen and where there is hemolysis congestion and infarction happening see over here when there is a reversible sickling okay so what happens they will clog the uh, 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 microvascular so uh, the, the blood vessels they clog the blood vessels and they can present as pain uh, uh, pain crisis and all that so i'll be talking about the various crises which happens in sickle cell uh, anemia okay so another thing you should know is there is sickle cell disease okay so there is something something called a sickle cell disease so in sickle cell disease both the entities come so even a homozygous patient who has a sickle who, who has sickle cell anemia is also in the sickle cell disease and also the heterozygotes who have uh, up to 50% of hbs that is the hemoglobin s are also in, included in sickle cell disease okay and another tell me what is the inheritance pattern of sickle cell disease what is the inheritance pattern of sickle cell disease i mean or anemia so what is the inheritance pattern so the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive autosomal recessive okay so the inheritance pattern is autosomal recessive so next coming to the clinical features so the first thing you should know is fever and bacteremia so the children who have sickle cell anemia have a high chance of developing fever and this becomes a medical emergency emergency and you have to uh, hospitalize this patient you have to get a medical evaluation so a child who has sickle cell anemia who develops fever you can't take it very lightly you have to take to the hospital this child should be evaluated and started on antibiotics okay because there is high risk of high risk of of developing bacterial infection and going to leading to mortality okay so these children have high chance of developing yeah hello bit to bit to yadav okay hi so we we'll, we are discussing about sickle cell anemia here so we we'll now the clinical features okay so there is high risk of bacterial infection and these children going to mortality is very high and so this uh, these children can have abnormal immune function they can have abnormal immune function immune function okay because of this they have repeated episodes of bacteremia because oh, in these children there is splenic infarction happening concentrate on these studies you only have to study no you no know, uh, other social media no instagram nothing only studying that is the only way you can crack okay so if you have friends you can discuss with them daily for half an hour or so okay you you will crack you have to daily study that is the only way so you shouldn't stress yourself daily make your uh, pattern of studying uh, for so many hours you will study and all that only then you can crack it no uh, roaming around no uh, going uh, going through social media youtube uh, youtube only you can attend our classes no are watching other uh, uh, youtube uh, videos for entertainment okay so all that is very should be very disciplined during this period fine so i'll talk at the end of the class so let us finish what we were uh, taught of today okay so these patients have a high risk of developing what infection so infection due to encapsulated encapsulated organisms so that is streptococcus pneumoniae streptococcus pneumoniae there is h influenza b then there is nigeria meningitis so these are the infections which these children have so and also uh, the drug of choice which you can go is for ceftriaxone okay but when these children are on ceftriaxone they might go for hemolysis so you have to watch for hemolysis for hemolysis 
and another thing is if these children are suspected to have infection with salmonella species or staph aureus then you should keep in mind that there is an increased risk of developing osteomyelitis okay uh, increased risk of so if there is sorry if there is staph staphylococcus aureus or salmonella species or salmonella species infection there are high chance of going for osteomyelitis osteomyelitis so increased risk of keep that in mind okay so children who have sickle cell anemia and they come with fever and if you suspect this patient could be having the staphylococcal aureus infection or a salmonella species infection then these children have a high risk of developing osteomyelitis so next you have to know what are the clinical factors which are associated with increased risk of bacteremia in a child with sickle cell anemia so first of all and these children will require admission so first seriously ill seriously ill appearance okay second hypotension so if these children have hypotension so if a systolic blood pressure of less than less than 70 okay if there is a systolic blood pressure of less than 70 okay that uh, that means hypotension in a child okay next poor perfusion so how do you see poor perfusion so if the capillary refill time if the capillary refill time okay is less than four okay uh, is less than four minutes okay then it suspects poor perfusion next fourth a corrected white cell count white cell count of more than 30,000 WBC count of more than 1,000 so either leukocytosis or leukopenia so more than 30,000 or less than 5,000 okay so that you should know if a platelet count platelet count of less than 1 lakh okay if there was already a history of pneumococcal sepsis in this child so they are highly prone to develop pneumococcal sepsis again and again Yes, Bitu, I will talk about how to concentrate on your class, I mean on your studies at the end of this class, okay? Because I am taking a class now, let me finish this and then we will uh, talk about it, okay? So, be, be there till the end of the class. History of pneumococcal, history of pneumococcal um, sepsis, seventh. So, if there was severe pain, so you know these children... Uh, so if these children have, uh, uh, what is it, in sickle cell anemia, these children have a lot of pain crisis. So they can, they can have acute chest syndrome, they can have severe dactylitis, right? So these children, if they have severe pain, if there is dehydration, okay, if there is dehydration and involvement of lung. So another important thing is, see in a child with sickle cell anemia, there can be lung involvement, okay, so they can have a patch which develops. So that is again a, a, a chance of a mortality in these children. So development of a, a infiltration in the lung, infiltration in the in lung. So lastly, hemoglobin which is less than 5 gram per deciliter. So these are all the conditions which are associated with increased risk of bacteremia and these children uh, 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 these children have to be admitted. Okay. So very important. So there is seriously ill appearance if the, uh, the child was seriously uh, ill looking child, uh, blood pressure of less than 70. If these children have poor perfusion, that is the capillary refill time of less than four minutes okay and another thing is a wbc count either there is leukocytosis or there is leukopenia okay a total count of above 30000 or less than 5000 <coughs> platelet count of less than 1 lakh right and if there was already a history of pneumococcal sepsis severe pain dehydration presence of infiltration in the lung and another very important thing is a hemoglobin of less than 5 gram per deciliter so these are all uh, associated with high risk of bacteremia in a child with sickle cell anemia next coming to the aplastic crisis okay so what is this aplastic crisis 
so what happens so basically in these children they have an increased risk of i mean a plastic crisis i mean a places so basically a granulocytosis in the child who has sickle cell anemia when they have an infection with parvo virus parvo b19 virus okay parvo virus b19 so this is a very serious condition so these children uh, suddenly if they go for a plastic crisis this uh, the infection might worsen so in these children you have to give blood transfusion okay so these children you have to give blood transfusion okay so that at least because this is a temporary transient aplastic crisis which happens in these children so you have to give blood transfusion only then the, there will be correction of the aplast uh, the crisis which is happening okay so the main reason for these children to go for aplastic crisis is an infection with human parvovirus b19 okay so this is the reason so next going to splenic sequestration so what is splenic sequestration splenic sequestration so what happens is so this is a very it's a life threatening complication so this is a life threatening complication complication especially in infants and young children who have sickle cell anemia okay so this is a life threatening complication so this sequestration can occur as early as 5 weeks of age and by the age of uh, by the age of 5 years some uh, these children might have asplenia as well okay so this uh, sequestration can occur in the case of severe uh, uh, sickle cell anemia it can occur as early as Five weeks of age. Okay, so how do these children present? So these children will present with splenic enlargement. Okay, so these will present with splenic enlargement. Enlargement. There will be left-sided abdominal pain. Left-sided. Pain. Okay, and there will be a sudden decrease in the hemoglobin. So there will be sudden decrease in the hemoglobin. So at least two gram per uh, liter of hemoglobin will fall from the baseline. Okay, at least two gram per liter of hemoglobin will fall below from the baseline. From baseline. Okay, so now, so these children, since there is uh, uh, there is sudden uh, fall of hemoglobin, you have to transfuse. But the transfusion is the not not the normal rate which you give. So in normally in children, you give 10 ml per kg. But the transfusion in these children, you should give 5 ml per kg because uh, when you start transfusing, the sequestration which is happening uh, in the spleen, that time they start releasing the RBC. So there will be a sudden increase in hemoglobin once you start transfusing using and these children might go into there is something called as hyper viscosity syndrome so the thickness of the blood will increase so hyper viscosity syndrome so that is why in a child who has the splenic sequestration though the hemoglobin comes down so you have to see that the transfusion is only 5 ml per kg because uh, uh, otherwise there will be sudden increase because of the rbcs which are released from the sequestered rbcs which are released from the spleen along uh, during the time of transfusion okay so that is why uh, 5 ml per kg is given otherwise there will be hyper viscosity syndrome in these children okay so another way of preventing this splenic uh, sequestration is by doing a prophylactic prophylactic splenectomy so once this acute phase of splenic sequestration has been resolved then you do a prophylactic splenectomy and because uh, the thing is the splenic sequestration can have recurrence so if, uh, even though you have treated with blood transfusion this child can have a re another recurring episode of splenic sequestration splenic sequestration so that is why these children have to go for prophylactic splenectomy okay so Next, coming to sickle cell pain. So, tell me what are the various types of pain what these children can uh, present with? Various kinds of pain. So, the first thing is the dactylitis. 
so the dactylitis so in dactylitis what happens so this dactylitis in sickle cell pain is also called as the hand foot syndrome hand foot syndrome okay so this can be this is seen in infants and young children so what happens over here so there could be this unilateral swelling of the uh, fingers okay there will be unilateral swelling of the fingers okay there could be unilateral dactylitis fingers or the feet okay unilateral swelling fingers or toes okay so these children this pain will be so severe because basically this why does it happen because the sickle cells occlude the microvasculature okay so that is why this pain severe pain happens and in such cases these children will require a analgesic so a drug which is used is hydrocodone hydrocodone okay so that helps in relieving the pain in these children okay so remember sickle cell pain that is the dactylitis hand foot syndrome okay also known as hand foot syndrome there is a unilateral swelling of fingers and toes and uh, this, since this is very painful this can lead to hydro uh, uh, these children should be treated with hydrocodone next uh, painful situation is where where do you see so next painful situation is the acute vaso occlusive pain so you should remember the acute vaso occlusive pain okay so here what happens these children with acute vaso occlusive pain they will have continuous pain so they will be continuous discomfort okay so they will have continuous discomfort And that can include any part of the body. So that could be chest, it could be abdomen. Okay, so that this uh, discomfort can occur in any part of the body. So again, this vaso occlusive pain is why it is because of this sickle cells which go and clog the various uh, vessels. That is why this happens. So it can happen in any organ. Okay, so basically there is a continuous discomfort. It could be in the chest, it could be in the abdomen, it could be in the extremities. okay so these children these children will have a sudden onset of pain okay and it and these children have to have certain analgesics to reduce the pain okay so remember dactylitis that is the hand foot syndrome and the acute vaso occlusive pain that can occur cause a continuous discomfort in various uh, parts of the body okay so this you should keep in mind so abrupt onset of pain onset of pain and this will uh, lead uh, this will disrupt the various um, disrupt uh, daily activities in these children okay so remember this Okay, and another thing is when these have pain one is you can go for NSID so treatment could be with NSIDs okay hydrocodone okay and if there is no improvement in pain these children have to be hospitalized hospitalized okay they have to be hospitalized and given morphine okay so in these children they do not go for that addiction or the dependency of morphine and that is why you shouldn't look twice uh, to give morphine in these children okay so because it's a very painful situation and these children have to man be managed okay giving warmth to the uh, in the home uh, at, at home management could be giving warmth to this uh, areas where there is pain you can uh, put the cover the child with blankets so that you know it will make the child more comfortable okay next coming to the avascular necrosis so the head of the femur is the most common area for avascular necrosis okay so head of the femur is the most common area for avascular necrosis and because of the avascular necrosis occurring in the head of the femur that will lead to limb length limb length discrepancy limb length discrepancy 
okay so the head of the femur when there is avascular necrosis of the head of the femur that can lead to limb length discrepancy okay so that is one thing you should know about and because of this there will be limb okay there will be limping the child will also limp okay so next so next what you should know so what are the risk factors for a child with avascular necrosis so what are the risk factors so the risk factors include so if there is uh, this hbss okay this uh, sickle cell disease with a thalassemia trait along with the thalassemia trait a child who has sickle cell disease also they have a thalassemia trait so these children have a high chance of avascular necrosis next if these children have frequent episodes of vaso occlusive uh, episodes so frequent vaso occlusive episodes episodes and there will be if there is increased hematocrit so these are the risk factors for avascular necrosis so another thing is the priapism so what is priapism so there is unwanted painful erection of the penis so unwanted painful erection okay so this can be uh, prolonged for more than 4 hours or it could be intermittent okay prolonged or intermittent fine next coming to the neurological complications so in the neurological complications what you should know so these children can present with a various presentation so it could be a acute ischemic uh, uh, stroke okay it could be a acute ischemic stroke stroke with a focal neurological deficit deficit or it could be a stroke without any uh, uh, any neurological deficit it could be a silent stroke okay so basically when you in, in silent stroke what happens the child is not having any symptoms but when you get an mri you can yes yes aparna correct so when you for the priapism the corpus cavernosum corpus cavernosum is involved yes so in these children if this priapism prolongs for more than 4 hours then you have to drain the blood blood if it is a prolonged for more than 4 hours okay yes fine now we'll go to the neurological complications so there is acute uh, ischemic stroke with a focal neurologic deficit and a silent stroke so silent stroke these when they get an mri you can see a, a abnormality in the mri but these children won't be symptomatic okay so in acute ischemic stroke they will have features of um, neurological deficit and also there is an mri abnormality so you should remember this okay so other neurological manifestations you see is these children will have any uh, seizures they'll have seizures they'll have a cvt there will be a cerebral venous thrombosis okay there is something called as reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome okay reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome syndrome or the press so what is press there is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome so either it is called as a reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome or the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome so this is what you have to see okay so the neurological complications either it could be an acute ischemic stroke with the focal neurological deficit or it could be a silent stroke and other features include seizures cerebral venous thrombosis there could be a reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome okay so you should know this so what is the pulmonary complication so this is the more, one of the second most common reason for admission in a child with sickle cell anemia okay so second most common cause for common cause for cause for hospital admission in children admission okay so what happens in these so in these uh, to tell the child has a pulmonary complication these children have to have a radio density that means there should be some kind of a opacity which is seen in the x ray so radio density or opacity 
should be present on x-ray so along with that so along with that any of the two following should be there so two or more should be present so what is it so one if there is fever if there is respiratory distress hypoxia there is cough or if there is chest pain okay so to tell this patient has a pulmonary complication first requirement is there should be an opacity on an x-ray and along with that any two of the following should be there so that is the child should have fever they should be the respiratory distress or hypoxia cough or chest pain so the child might come have an opacity but might not have a respiratory distress so no problem if there is fever and hypoxia or fever or cough anything is enough so there has to be a opacity on the chest x-ray to tell this is a pulmonary complication okay so this you should know <clears throat> so what are the day radio opacity densities which you see so what is it so either it could be a focal involvement okay so it could be a segment a single lobe involvement so single lobe involvement if it is there it is mostly a the left lower lobe or it could be a multiple uh, foci of involvement so that then it is the uh, uh, lower lobe on both the sides okay the lower lobe on both the sides is most commonly involved so next is what so there could be pleural effusions they could be pleural effusions so these pleural effusions could be unilateral or bilateral okay so there is single lobe involvement okay uh, uh, this opacities can be having a varied presentation so there could be a single lobe involvement that most commonly involved lobe is the left lower lobe or a multiple lobe involvement that could be because the involved uh, the most common is uh, involvement of the both side lower lobe. Next, presence of pleural effusion. There could be unilateral pleural effusion or a bilateral pleural effusion. So, this you should know. And these patients with um, a pulmonary complication rapidly progress. So, once you admit this child, you have to get a pulse oximeter reading continuously because they can rapidly progress and deteriorate. So, pulse oximeter monitoring is very important. monitoring is very important fine so that should be done in these children okay and tell me what are the organisms okay what are the organisms which can cause pulmonary infection in these uh, children with um, children with um, sickle cell anemia what are the organisms so one is the streptococcus pneumoniae mycoplasma pneumoniae and chlamydia species so these uh, organisms mostly cause uh, lung infections in a child with sickle cell anemia so this you should keep in mind okay so next coming to the cognitive and the psychological complications so when you see these children have a poor uh, school performance so there is poor school performance in these children Okay, and according to the research, what have they have been uh, they have done is only 20% of the student uh, children with sickle cell anemia are high school uh, graduates. They say, okay, so this is a, a worldwide uh, uh, data, not ju not just only India. Okay, so they say these children have poor cognitive and psychological complication. There is poor school performance. Okay, so that is seen in children with sickle cell anemia so next coming to the laboratory test so now we finished with all the clinical features so at the end of this class i go back and revise all what i've taught okay so now we have laboratory test and the treatment options so first is the laboratory test so when you get a laboratory test what do you see so when you do a cbc you see there is anemia there is thrombocytosis okay there is leukocytosis so leukocytosis that is the counts are more than 20,000 so, total count is more than 20,000 okay when you get a peripheral smear what do you see so you see uh, sickled red cells right you see sickled red cells you see sickle red cells then you see Havel jolly body so what does Havel jolly bodies indicate so Havel jolly bodies indicates that this is a, there is a functional asplenia Havel jolly bodies indicate 
there is functional asplenia so what are these uh, uh, havel jolly bodies so there is these are basophilic nuclear remnants basically these are clusters of dna okay so that uh, that indicates functional asplenia next uh, since there is hemolysis there is uh, hyperbilirubinemia so what hyperbilirubinemia there will be indirect hyperbilirubin will be increased that is a there is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia So next, when you get a HB electrophoresis, what do you see? So when you get a HB electrophoresis, what do you see? Okay, so when you get an HB electrophoresis, then uh, here you see that in patients who are homozygous, okay, homozygous, homozygous patients, you see the HBS is really high up to 80 to 90 percent. So yesterday I told you a normal individual have what should be the HB electrophoresis. In a normal individual you should see HBA. So HBA is alpha to beta to say so that should be up above 95 percent and around 2 to 3 percent you will see HBA2 right. So that is alpha to gamma 2. Alpha 2, delta 2, sorry. A fetus is agama 2. So, in homozygous, what happens? There is high sickle cell hemoglobin. So, that is 80 to 90 percent. And in case of heterozygotes, that is, they have a single uh, gene which is affected. In heterozygous, you see this HBS from 35 to 40 percent. Okay. So, these are, these uh, in these patients, you don't tell it is sickle cell anemia. They have sickle cell disease. So, homozygous patients are, they have, uh, they will present with anemia and they are, sick, they have sickle cell anemia. Fine. So, this is about HP electrophoresis. And this is a picture of, uh, uh, of the peripheral smear, peripheral smear of sickle cell disease. So, what do you see? So, over here you can see this sickling, you can see, right? The sickling, what you can see, that is a typical picture of uh, sickle cell anemia and also you can see these blue dots in the RBCs, right? So, these blue dots are the Howell Jolly bodies. Howell Jolly bodies. Okay? So, this you have to keep in mind. Yes. Yes, leukocytosis. You see leukocytosis. So, what did I write here? Leukocytosis only. Okay, so this you have to see. So, what are the treatment options? So, first thing is these patients are yes, yes, correct, Aparna, correct, correct. You see the shift to left, yes. Uh, so, coming to the treatment. So, in the treatment, what do you see? What do you give? So, first is the supportive management. Okay, so these patients have to require, have to get good amount of hydration. Okay, hydration. They will need blood transfusion. In pain crisis, yes, exactly, Aparna, yes, correct. Indirect hyperbilirubinemia is Ill elevated during, due to hemolysis, yes. Okay, so there is blood transfusion. Uh, these are all supported. Pain management, so pain management. So you can start with NSIDs, you can then eventually go for hydrocodone and if it is not being controlled, you can go for uh, parenteral morphine. Okay, so in the, such conditions, the child should be admitted. So next, so there is pain management happening. So next, what happened? What should you do? Antibiotic therapy in children who have severe infection. Okay, so these are the things you have to keep in mind. Okay, and uh, most most of the time these children have functional asplenia because of the severe splenic sequestration. So, one of the way condition for splenectomy is a prophylactic. Yes, prophylactic. Uh, very good, Aparna. Very good. Okay, so uh, another uh, thing is, um, what was I saying? A prophylactic splenectomy is done in case of splenic sequestration so that to prevent a repeated episode of splenic sequestration. Okay, so that is uh, for today. So today we have discussed all the uh, uh, in detail of sickle cell this, uh, anemia. So now we'll have a fast revision of fast revision of sickle cell anemia okay so in sickle cell anemia what happens the hemoglobin is the hbs this is a point mutation so basically there is a single base pair chain uh, uh, base pair change which happens so there will be thymine instead of adenine in the sixth codon of 
beta globin gene so as a result there will be formation of valine instead of glutamine in the sixth position of the beta globin molecule okay so that is why this uh, hbs is formed so this inheritance is the autosomal recessive inheritance so what happens when this hbs uh, hemoglobin is exposed to deoxygenation so there will be polymerization of this hbs molecule so this is also called as gelation or crystallization so this polymer polymerization these polymers distort the red cell okay so distort the red cell that is the, because it's a it forms a sickle cell so the initially what happens the initial part of the disease there is reoxygenation happening and this sickling gets reversed okay but as the sickling goes on uh, repeating there will be uh, membrane damage so there will be increased membrane damage and there will be accumulation of calcium and loss of potassium in the cell and this sickling becomes irreversible and this sickle cell goes to the spleen and gets destroyed okay so this was the picture which i showed about how the sickling happens so this is the pathophysiology uh, of uh, uh, sickle cell anemia next coming to the clinical feature so you should know the first thing is fever and bacteremia so these children have an abnormal immune function because of this splenic infarction which is happening and as a result they have a high risk of developing infection that is they'll have fever and bacteremia and this fever and bacteremia in a child with sickle cell anemia is a medical emergency and the child will require antibiotics so these uh, and uh, uh, another big reason because why is it medical emergency because there is a high risk of these bacterial infection and they can go for mortality okay so the infection uh, mostly which uh, uh, which these children are susceptible to is the streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza B and the Nizera meningitis. So ceftriaxone is generally given in these children and but ceftriaxone can cause hemolysis and that is why we have to uh, see uh, for hemolysis once you start ceftriaxone in this child. Okay, so staph aureus and salmonella species. Okay, um, yes, yes, correct. Correct, Aparna. So, one is the penicillin prophylaxis is given for five years in these children because there is uh, splenic sequestration which is happening. Very excellent. I forgot to tell that. I'll tell this, uh, I'll repeat that point at the end of this class. Okay, exactly. Very good. Okay, so ceftriaxone uh, is given and the staph aureus and salmonella species, if it is, uh, if you're suspecting um, the staph aureus and salmonella species, you have to. Uh, suspect osteomyelitis in this. Okay, Aparna, tell me why hydroxyurea? Why is hydroxyurea given? Yes, yes. So, in, to increase the Hb uh, hemoglobin, uh, fetal hemoglobin. Very good, very good. Okay. So, uh, to tell uh, these children have a high risk of bacteremia, what are the uh, points you have to keep in mind? So, uh, high risk of bacteria requiring hospital admission. So, a child with sickle cell anemia, they will they'll be seriously ill looking. They will have, they might have hypotension. They might have poor perfusion. That is the, the capillary refill time might be less than 4 minutes. A, a corrected WBC count of more than 13,000 or less than 5,000. A platelet count of less than 1 lakh. If there was a history of pneumococcal uh, sepsis, if there was severe pain, if there is dehydration, if there is infiltration in the lung, okay, or if there is a hemoglobin of less than 5 gram per deciliter. So, these are the uh, conditions in a child who has bacteremia, increased risk of bacteremia with sickle cell disease. You have to admit the child, okay. So, aplastic crisis, so these uh, children with sickle cell anemia can go for aplastic crisis, especially with an infection with human parvovirus B19. Okay, and in such times when there is this aplastic crisis, these children will require blood transfusion. Okay, so this is a transient aplastic uh, aplasia which is happening, and that is why blood transfusion helps in managing the situation. So there is splenic sequestration which is happening. There is sequestration of the RBCs which is happening. So when the splenic sequestration is happening, this can be very life-threatening and dangerous and there can be mortality also if it is not managed at the right time. So this splenic sequestration can occur as early as 5 weeks of age. Okay, so how do you know? So there is sudden increase in the spleen. So there is splenic enlargement. There is left-sided abdominal pain and then there is sudden fall in the hemoglobin. So at least 2 gram per liter, uh, deciliter of hemoglobin falls from the baseline 
okay so at this point of time you have to transfuse so blood transfusion should be done but you should be careful you shouldn't be giving the normal 10 ml per kg of blood transfusion you should reduce because when the time when you start giving blood transfusion there is slowly release of this sequestrated rbc's and as a result there will be sudden increase in the hemoglobin therefore you give 5 ml per kg so if you give more hemoglobin these children can go for hyper viscosity syndrome so there is increased thickness of the blood and it can lead to other uh, associated problems so once this acute episode of splenic sequestration is over uh, then you can go for prophylactic splenectomy in order to prevent another um, uh, repeat, repeat of these uh, episodes of splenic sequestration so something called as sickle cell pain so you two things you need to remember one is dactylitis or the hand foot syndrome okay so basically this vaso uh, uh, this uh, pain crisis happens because there is a uh, occlusion of this blood vessels by the sickle cell uh, sickle cells so in dactylitis what happens there is unilateral swelling of the fingers or the toes okay and there will be severe pain so that is managed by hydrocodone then there is this acute vaso occlusive pain so again basic because this uh, sickle cell um, sickle cells they can clog the various uh, arteries or vessels in the various uh, uh, organs and this uh, this can develop as a continuous discomfort unremitting discomfort in these children it could be in the chest it could be in the abdomen it could be in the extremity so it could be anywhere in the body so this pain is abrupt okay and as a result this pain is continuous and abrupt and this will disrupt your daily activity so these children should be treated with nsids okay if not next hydrocodone and even then the child pain is not coming down then the child should be hospitalized for i uh, uh, parenteral morphine okay next coming to the avascular necrosis so in these children the head of the femur so there is the most common site for avascular necrosis is the head of the femur so there is limb length discrepancy which happens there is limp in these children so there is a limping gait because of the uh, avascular necrosis of the head of the femur so the risk factors in these children is these children who have uh, this uh, sickle cell disease along with thalassemia traits such children are at a high risk of avascular necrosis children who have frequent vaso occlusive episodes are at high risk of avascular necrosis and children who have an increased uh, hematocrit are at a high chance of avascular necrosis next coming to priapism so what is priapism that is unwanted painful erection of the penis which is seen in these children and this could be prolonged or intermittent prolonged meaning the uh, erection could is more than uh, for 4 hours so generally this uh, occurs between 3 am to 9 am okay so why, uh, and this occurs because of the filling of blood in the uh, corpus cavernosum so if this uh, this is prolonged this this uh, filling of blood is increased in the corpus cavernosum for more than 4 hours then the blood should be drained out next coming to the neurological complications so these children can present with the have a varied presentation so they can have an acute ischemic stroke with focal neurological deficit to a silent stroke so basically they have a uh, uh, what is it uh, they have a abnormality or they have a, a uh what is it a uh, st stroke kind of picture in the brain when you get an mri but they are asymptomatic so that is called a silent stroke so along with that they these children can present as uh, with seizures there will be cerebral venous thrombosis or they could be reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy so next coming to the complications or pulmonary complications so this is the second most common cause of hospital admission in a child with sickle cell anemia so how do you tell this child has pulmonary complications so first thing is a must to have a diagnosis for pulmonary complication is a the presence of an opacity on the chest x ray so there should be a radiological dense opacity on an x ray so if there is any infiltration in the lung then you have to suspect so along with that so along with that the child should have two or more of the following what is it so either the child should have fever respiratory distress hypoxia cough or chest pain so if any of this two of this is present along with a opacity on the chest x ray then you should think this child has a lung complication okay so it it could be uh, the radio uh, radio opacity could be any presentation so it could be a single lobe involvement so the most common lobe involved is the left lower lobe or it could be multiple involvement multiple areas are involved so if it is a multiple involvement it could be bilateral lower lobe 
or that could be pleural effusion then it could be unilateral or it could be bilateral so any of this could be present in a child with sickle cell anemia right and also in these uh, pulmonary complications what happens is in a child with sickle cell anemia there will be a rapid deterioration so that is why you have to have a pulse oximeter monitoring uh, continuously otherwise these children will suddenly deteriorate okay and the organisms which cause infection in the child uh, lung infection in a child with sickle cell anemia is streptococcus pneumoniae mycoplasma pneumoniae or chlamydia species so this you should keep in mind coming to the cognitive and the psychological complications so they say according to there are various studies done so they see this cognition is very poor in these children and there is poor school performance in children with sickle cell anemia okay so next coming to the laboratory test so when you get a cbc there will be anemia there will be thrombocytosis there is leukocytosis there is a total count of more than 20000 when you get a peripheral here you can see the sickle uh, uh, sickle red cell so what you have to know uh, sickle red cell and also there is havel jolly bodies okay so if when there is havel jolly bodies that will indicate there is functional asplenia so another thing you should know about is the sickling test so when you dilute the patient's blood with sodium metabisulfate sodium metabisulfate sulfite what do you see is there is decrease in oxygen tension and it will lead to sickling okay so this is the sickling test you should know about sodium metabisulfite is given there will be decrease in the oxygen tension and it will lead to sickling okay that is one thing and next is the hp electrophoresis so when you get an hp electrophoresis in a child with sickle cell anemia in a homozygous condition or uh, in uh, uh, patients who are symptomatic where you see that the hbs that is a sickle cell hemoglobin is 80 to 90 percent. While normally in a normal person, what you have to see is HbA. So HbA should be between 95 to 90 per 98 percent, and HbA2 will be around 2 to 3 percent. That is the normal HP electrophoresis. But in a child with sickle cell anemia, what do you see? Homozygous in in a patient who has a disease, HbA is 80 to 90 percent. In carrier state or in the heterozygous, you see that HbA is 35 to 40 percent. Okay. Next, coming to the sickle cell, the peripheral smear. So, in the peripheral smear, as you can see here, so as you can see, there is sickling of the cell. So, the arrow which has a double arrow, it shows the sickling of the cells. There is this elongated crescentric, uh, crescentric picture, crescentic kind of a shape which you can see. And here, this is the blue dot. So, this Havel Jolly bodies can be purple to. reddish colored dots in the rbc so that indicates uh, that indicates havel jolly bodies fine next next coming to the treatment so the main treatment is supportive you give hydration there is blood transfusion should be done in these children pain management is another very important thing so i said either you start with nsids no improvement you go for hydrocodone no improvement the child should be hospitalized and can be given parenteral uh, morphine next is antibiotics for in, uh, uh, for um, infection control and next is as aparna said right so we have to give hydroxyurea this helps in increasing the so yesterday in my class with thalassemia i told hydroxyurea increases the fetal hemoglobin okay so hydroxyurea increases the fetal hemoglobin so that is another drug which is used and uh, and also you have to give in these children so penicillin prophylaxis you so you have to give penicillin prophylaxis because these children have a high chance for going for splenic sequestration also going for a severe infection so splenic profi uh, penicillin prophylaxis is given in these children okay so we have discussed so today's topic in detail so th this was about um, sickle cell anemia so one second yeah the sickle cell anemia so what you should know is tomorrow we'll be discussing about uh, aplastic anemia so in aplastic anemia i'll be discussing fanconi anemia okay so this might be a recorded class i'm not sure based on my availability let's see so this is a fanconi anemia which i'll be discussing at 1 pm okay tomorrow in the special class okay special class at 4 pm i'll be discussing um, kawasaki disease 
Kawasaki rupees and on uh, tomorrow is Friday right so on Sunday I will discuss I think it will be a morning class somewhere around 10 a.m. or so so I will be discussing about um, uh, this thing uh, uh, Enoch Shonlain Popura so Takayasu's arthritis all that thoroughly I will start so the first class on vasculitis will be on Henoch Shonlain Popura so that will be on Sunday at 10 a.m. tomorrow in the special class at 4 p.m. I will be discussing about Kawasaki disease okay yet uh, tomorrow here in uh, youtube at one o'clock i'll be discussing about fanconi anemia okay so this was about today and uh, another thing is if you're when you're subscribing to the subscription use my code shilpa 10 you get a 10 percent discount and this will help me to remain in this platform for a longer time okay so very important when you're studying i always say study daily do not miss a day it will put you in a lazy mode second avoid social media right avoid social media if you do not don't avoid social media you will only waste time and this is one year's preparation so i know you all will uh, feel very tired or exhausted so that is why uh, study for three hours take a half an hour break and again study for some more time so it, it only then you can if you, if you don't study daily because it's a 19 subjects uh, uh, preparation and it, it it will make you exhausted so that is why take a break of half an hour or something in between and uh, discuss with your friends so that will rejuvenate you better okay another thing is sleep early wake up early and study that also helps you a lot okay fine yeah what is basophilic aparna you're talking about hoil jolly body hoil jolly bodies right okay fine so this is what we are going to discuss okay so good luck study well stay safe and stay healthy fine